blessing God good? Yeah. Amen. Oh, isn't, it, isn't it amazing that, um, you know, Oral Roberts used to say, expect a miracle every yes. day. Amen. And the Christian world rose up against him and said, how dare you do that? That's beyond reason. Well, why not? Amen. Why should we expect a miracle every day? Amen. Mm. You know, a lot of things he did, um, he was chastised for. Yet he was trying to bring the blessings of God to us, knowing who we are in Christ. Yes. He, was a, he was an awesome man. Yes. He, he did a, a lot of groundwork, particularly in the areas of England. Amen. You know, the medical profession tried, tried to shut him down. Well, they did actually, in the end, shut him down. Because of his beliefs. He had a, a large hospital where he trained staff. Uh, but there was also not just the worldly system, but also the spiritual side and prayer. And uh, the, the great um, medical association didn't like that. And so they would hammer him all the time. He was always fighting lawsuits against them. And uh, in the end, he, he closed certain parts of it down because he got too much for it. But he, he did a lot of good work, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Amen. No, we need to be excited. Then you hear... I heard just the other day, you know, and, 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 and I, I struggle to, I, I know it's, I probably believed this many years ago, but it's like with a great amount of, of knowledge we can tap into. Many people think that when you get saved, God forgives all your sins. Mm. All agree with that? Yep. Yeah, that's it. But from then on, you've got to repent of every single sin you do, oh. otherwise the devil will get you. I mean, there was a, um, particularly sort of about 56 years ago, there was 50 to 60 years ago, there was quite a following of, if you're sick, then you probably let the devil in, and uh, you've done something naughty, there's probably sin in your life, and, and that's how, how they used to think. Many used to think that way. Some still do. Nothing could be further from the truth. Amen. The devil will have a go anyway. Don't have to open the door, eh? Opening the door is a strange and sometimes totally misunderstood. Yes, you will open the door if you get into stress and worry and all those things. Not because the devil, you're giving a door as you to the devil, you're giving a door to your own spirit because you're not trusting God. That's all it means. Worry, anxiety, stress, they all cause sickness. Even the medical world knows that. Because it releases things into your body. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought it was good. Alright, Genesis 2. I want to... I, I know that this is a passage that we, we have gone over many times. Uh, but there's always something when you go over them again and again and again. There's some new things start to pop out. There's some new things that you can start to grab hold of. In verse 21... This is when, I'll um, oh, just go back a little, just a little bit, the 15, verse 15, because we're talking about when, when Adam was in the garden, Adam and Eve, and we know the story about how Eve took of the, of the fruit from the tree of life when God had said, do not touch this, leave this alone, and she gave it to her husband. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So God, in his wisdom, what verse are you? Verse 18. Oh. Okay. Did I jump in here? Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go back a little bit. <laughs> I got that in my own mind, just to give it the catch up. <laughs> Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Now, when we see the word Garden of Eden, we immediately, in, in our way of thinking, we see this beautiful, sumptuous garden with all luscious fruits and, and things. But we've got to remember that word Garden of Eden was actually the presence of God, which is more important than all the luscious things. Yes, they come, or well, they came, because of the presence of God. Amen. Eden means the presence of God. So that God placed Adam into the presence of God in this beautiful garden. But sometimes, because we're that way of thinking, we think so much 
worship of the garden rather than realizing the presence yeah. which is far greater. Mm. Put in the garden of Eden, tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded, this is verse 16 now, and the Lord commanded the command saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you shall eat of it, and you shall surely die. The knowledge of good and evil. You know, when you, when you first read that, you start to think, well, what's the matter with that? Why can't we have the knowledge of good and evil? What's, what's wrong with that? Isn't it good that we have the knowledge of evil as well as the good? What he's trying to say is if you partake of that tree, there is a lot of good knowledge out there. But because it's worldly knowledge, it can become evil. Because it's done in, in your own strength. And this is what God was trying to warn him. I don't want you doing things in your own strength. By knowing good and evil, you will be, tem you'll be tempted, as man is, tempted to do so much more in your own strength rather than drawing on the strength of God. And that's what, what literally Adam stepped out of, the presence of God. When he, when, he made, when he went with what uh, Eve had said. Now, Eve saw that the fruit was good, and it, it looked good to eat. And she thought, well, you know, the devil had, had confused her and saying, you will be very wise. No, she lost the wisdom because she's now in the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world, I think we can all see, is not good, is it? We've got a monetary system that is not good. We need money to buy and sell goods. We need that money, but the monetary system now is virtually nothing wrong with the mon a, a money system, but when the monetary system is only out, out there to extract what it can out of you. For instance, let's look at the credit card. Why are they call it the credit card? I don't know. It's really a debit card. But it's like the bank will send you letters and say, it's like it's a privilege to own a credit card. It's not a privilege. It's making them big money. Big money. Up to 25% on what you spend. So it's, it's, it's not a privilege at all. It's only out there to make the money. You buy a house on higher purchases. I, I looked at the um, thing the other day. Okay, we'll, I don't want to say don't buy a house on higher purchases. I mean, that's a loan. That's okay. As long as you're using it for steps up and looking for a way to, to finish that loan up. But what I'm saying is it's interesting that the house that you pay four or five hundred thousand for, fifty thousand goes to the bank in interest. Now actually it's more than fifty thousand. It's fifty thousand on your account. They make much more than that because every time you pay a repayment, they loan that out again. And then when that person let the loan it out again. So their, their um, finances is astronomical on your one loan. Mm -hmm. They make so much money out of this. So don't think the bank is a privilege. <laughs> it's a way it's set up to get you in debt. <clears throat> if you, you know, if you, sometimes we have to own a credit card. We've, we've got a credit card. Because we need to buy things from overseas. But we make sure it's paid off every month. Yeah. And then it becomes a tool that we can use without letting the bank suck us dry. Yeah. Nothing wrong with credit cards. Just make sure that you can afford to pay them off each time. Is that right? I don't yes. know what I'm going to read yes. something. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a good thing to know that God is for us and always look for supernatural ways to get out of debt. Amen. And, you know, what people don't realize quite often is that if you can afford $10 a week extra on your mortgage, the other end, you're going to save hundreds, hundreds and even thousands. Just by paying one extra $10, never pay interest only, because if you've you dug a hole, you can never get out. Okay. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Are you happy with that? Yes. yes. Not offended, but upset. Oh. Another one, I just can't help myself more. Because I know many people get themselves into, into holes they struggle.
struggling it out of. You see this on, and, and the world system. It's, it comes on the TV about consolidate all your loans into one. And then it's only one payment, people. Don't fall for that. That is the devil's way of keeping you in debt longer. Each, if you've got several, you pay off one as quick as you can. And then with the same amount that you normally would have paid that, you then pay the second one. When the second one's paid off, now you've got two amounts that you normally would have paid, you pay off the third one and you will be out of debt a lot quicker. Yeah. Consolidated loan, all you've done is extended your loan. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for your wisdom. Okay, let's go. <laughs> The moment 
they disobeyed what God had said. That Eden presence of God lifted. They saw they were naked because they'd taken of the good and evil. Then the good and the evil now were starting to come in. Now, this, for instance, the, the sexual realm, the sex, the sex that God's given us is a beautiful gift that God has given us. But it can be so perverted that it can become evil. We all see that, don't we? That's, that's not a problem. They saw that, and it's verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, of the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. Hid themselves. Before they were able to walk and talk with God, now there's an area of guilt that has come upon them. How many times have you, don't put your hand up, how many times have you, has situations like this happened where you have owed money to somebody, you've had an argument with somebody, or you just don't want to be near somebody, so what do you do? You hide yourself from them. You might even cross the road to avoid them, or look the other way that you didn't really see them. You may do many things. Why? Why is that? Because you feel guilty that you owe that person money. Even though that person, you may be working with that person to pay that debt off, you still feel guilty that you owe the money. So you hide from situations rather than face them. Facing situations actually does help a lot in getting that pressure off you. You owe money, go and see somebody, talk about it. Even if it's a, a creditor, go and see them. Say, look, I'm stuck at the moment. Will you accept the fact that I can pay some money off and get back? And don't, many people ignore it and the, and the situation gets worse. Particularly when, when you start getting interest on interest on interest. The bill gets bigger and bigger and bigger instead of just, just facing it. And the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? I thought God was so big that he knew where everyone was. Is that right? He's doing this for a purpose. He's challenging them. So he said, I heard, Adam said, So I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you? that you should not eat. Now watch this part. This is the changing part. This is why we ended up with, with needing Jesus to come back. Because at this point, verse 12, Then the man said, The woman whom thou gave to me, or gave to me with me, she gave me a, of the tree, and I ate it. Now, do you see anything there where Adam is repenting? No. Now I know nobody here would ever shift blame into other things. It's like, no, I, I take full responsibility in my life. It couldn't possibly be, you know. I, I'm in this situation because blame, blame, blame. Now, what would have happened, we'll never know, but what would have happened, you think, if Adam had got on his knees and said, Lord, I have sinned, please forgive me, let's work something out, let's rectify this. But he didn't. So God challenged him. The woman that thou gavest me. Now, let's go back to the point where the rib was taken out and made into a beautiful woman. The two became one. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, and I believe it was Adam's sin, when you see, see Adam was the original. The woman was given to complete the man. But the woman part of man was taken out. That's why we, we'll never understand each other. <laughs> We'll try, we'll do our best, you know. Because that bit was taken out of me. Yeah. So how can you ever, you know, when women say, men, I wish you'd find your feminine side, well, you are. <laughs> you know, I haven't got one. <laughs> That's why 
why we're so different. We're meant to be different. Because we complement each other. But under the Old Testament, you've got to realise that she was a, as classed as, as the helper, which she still is today, but I, I'm just showing from a different perspective. She's the helper. And so he is the covering of the woman. Even in, in Middle Eastern cultures today, the woman is a second class citizen and everything has to go for her husband. He virtually has life and death in his hands. Yep. And that hasn't changed because that's still, much of it is, is old covenant. So when, and, and when we read this, we find that Adam was told to tend the garden. In other words, get off your butt and work. So man has been given a stronger body to work. And it's man's job to work to provide for the woman. Amen. Now why women would woman would even consider marrying a man that's not working is beyond me. That's his job. That's his that's his job on this earth is to provide for his family. Amen. It's his job. The woman is a helpmate. She can work as well. If, they, if they're looking for goals for a house and this, that and the other, nothing wrong with a woman working. Although in saying that, you better make sure where the woman is working that she's not spending more time with another man than what she should be. Because that is a danger as well. So you, you know, you've got to use a bit of common sense here. It's a helper. In, in the olden days, of course, the woman would help uh, within the situation that they were doing, you know what I mean? Within the family type, it would be a family type business. But, but if, if a woman is spending too much time with another man, then temptations are there that you really, you're putting her into which you should, shouldn't be doing. Amen. Okay? Yes. <laughs> now, the presence of God had lifted because of what had happened, but it's now the man's job to create the presence of God so that the woman can, can respect me. Many, many men have come to me over the years and said, you better tell my wife who's the head of this household. <laughs> you better sort her out, Pastor. And the things I'd always challenge them with, are you the spiritual head or just the controlling head? Or are you just a big head? <laughs> See, if the husband is not the spiritual head, he really does not have the right to rule as an overall ruler. How do you know? How do you know that you, if you want to be the head, being the head actually is quite a job. Yes, a woman is the neck, she controls the head quite often, but let's, let's look beyond that. You know, that's, that's their prerogative. <laughs> but if you want to be the head, you've got to act like one. For instance, if you have debts and the phone rings and you know it's the creditor ringing up the bank, ringing up, wanting to know why you haven't paid, then it's not for you to go and say, wife, I want you to go and answer that and you fix it. <laughs> Somebody knocks on the door and you look out and you think, oh, I don't want to talk to them because I owe the money and the wife, you better answer the door. No, as being the head of the house, you've got to be the head of the house. Amen. Bit hard, eh? Yes. But a man is a man. Are you a man? I mean, a, a, a man as, as a father can produce a baby. It doesn't make him a real man. A real man is the spiritual head of, head of the house. Yes. So that the wife knows that if she goes to him, he can go to the Lord and, and sort problems out. But nowadays, many men have reneged to and let their wife be the spiritual head because they can't be bothered.
You are the, the covering of that family. It hasn't changed its position of a wife as a helpmate. In the New Testament, that hasn't changed. But what has changed is that the covering overall is the Holy Spirit. But for a man to lead his household, he must know, or he must be able to, to walk and talk with God and still listen. Listen to, to the wife's opinion. Listen to what the wife has to say. Because their discernment in many areas is better than man's. Because remember, that's the bit that was taken out. <laughs> so that's the bit you want back in. You can be shocking. <laughs> See, a man cannot rule out of head knowledge. He cannot rule out of world's knowledge. He's got to lead out of the knowledge of God. Amen. Otherwise you will make many, many mistakes. Adam sin, Adam sin did cause the world to change. Let's look at verse 16, an interesting thing. God said to the woman, I greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And that's where many have said, well, there, there it is, she, I'll rule over it. Yes, there is a ruling that you've got to rule in the natural you've got to rule in the spiritual more than the natural. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nowadays, there has been many books written about women when, when you have a baby. If, you, if you're wanting to tap into that and expect to have a baby without pain, without excruciating pain, then that has been broken. See, many things have been broken by what Jesus did on the cross. But we don't, we don't put them into practice because we read that and say, oh, well, we're stuck with that. No, much has, been, much has changed from the old to the new. Everything, everything we read in the old must go through the cross to the new so that we can see, has Jesus fixed this? Has Jesus changed that? Has Jesus taken away those curses? Because these are curses, aren't they? Yes. I mean, there's one thing I never know about childhood. <laughs> it has been said, and I actually, I probably agree with this, if men had to have babies, the families would be a lot smaller. That's only what I do. And I'm actually uh, going to break, believe that. <clears throat> when you go through the pain, the baby, baby's there in your arms, and it's like, oh man, at last, the scraping of lumps here. <clears throat> But there's so much love that pours out for the woman that you're going to do it again. <laughs> well, I see, did you learn the first time? <laughs> Don't you know what pours is? <laughs> Verse 17. Then Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground you shall take, say. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat it. In toil you shall eat from it. We are, we are designed, men are designed to work. And now unfortunately, there's the other side of it, that many men get into so much work, they forget what uh, the other important part is your family. Yeah. They get so tied up in work that they forget their families fall apart and they wonder why. Because they're so busy trying to make money to provide for the family that they forget that if they trusted God for the provision, they wouldn't have to work uh, 90 hours a week. They'd be able to trust God for the provision. And so they've lost their spiritual thing because their whole life is taken up in work, 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 work. There's a place for work. There's not a place for overwork stopping your... The, the, the needs of your family, the spiritual needs, the, the, the playtime needs. You only get one shot with your children. You don't get a... I mean, we can look back and say, oh, only we've done this and done that and done something. You get one chance with your children as they're growing up and make the best of it. Don't put work as priority, priority, priority. Look at family as priority. Work, you can get another job, you can change jobs, you can, you can get it up, you know, build a business, whatever. Don't build the business until you get to the, the point that you've lost your family. That family is more important than business. Amen. Amen. But man's ways of thinking, because he's been given that, that goal, he's been given that, that desire to provide 
Sometimes his provision comes from the good and evil and not the good of trusting God to meet those needs. Does that make sense? I have a total confusion. Are you with me? Yes. yes. So important. So the, the ground was cursed. And we all know about that. I mean, weeds seem to grow faster than the good stuff, don't they? You notice that? I looked at our front garden the other day and I thought, whoa, it's out of control. There's so much cursing going on here. <laughs> says that you will toil through sweat and you shall surely die. You know, up until then there was no death. Adam had a perfect life and even more perfect when Eve was given to him. He had walking in the garden with God in everything so awesome and he blew it and he had to work and all the, all the problems of the world of isn't that incredible? I know somebody said there'd probably be quite a long queue wanting to talk to Alan, Adam when we get to heaven. <laughs> but let's face it. He did what he did, but Jesus reversed it. Yes. Understanding the grace and the mercy of God is such an important thing of, of uh, any message. <clears throat> let's finish off now with, with Hebrews 9. Don't you hear that word? You think, oh, yes, it's getting time for Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can wait a little bit longer, can't we? Yes. Can't we? Yes, we can. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made in hands, that is, not of his creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself spot, without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. By means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, and those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. <coughs> Isn't that awesome? We do not have to have sacrifice. If you want to go to the Old Testament, then each Sunday you better start bringing some lambs and goats and things like that. We'll receive them, no problem. If you want to go there. But that is finished. See, that is the Old Testament goes through the cross to the new. Now, once and for all, Jesus has set us free. You do not have to have a bad conscience. Your sins are forgiven. And some say, say, well, yes, your sins are forgiven for now, but are those of the future? Well, if we go back 2,000 years, we realize that it must be future because we weren't even born then. So your future sins, your present sins, your past sins, they're all forgiven. You don't walk in condemnation because of the blood of Jesus. Now Jesus is so good to us that he forgives us of all our sins. But, okay, so can I just sin and, and do what I like? No, you can't because there's consequences of sin. But we don't live in that. We live in knowing that when we sin we can go to the Father and, and still walk into the throne room because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Yes. That's his grace. That's what we live in. So instead of hiding when you do something wrong, which many of us do, instead of hiding, come to Christ. Even if you're in, even if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, do not hide from Christ and stop your fellowship with Him, because He'll be able to bring you back. Even though I don't really want to, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, do it, or God. You don't do that in your Okay, I'm going to have fun. God's not going to spoil my fun. 
what are the repercussions? Yeah. If it's not as it should be. So don't ever hide from God. Don't ever run away. Come to God. Yes. And you can get that release, that, that special peace and that joy that you can always walk in knowing that He's for you and not against you. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. The grace, the mercy, the love of God. Well, let's just turn to this. Are you ready? Yes. You are great, great highly favored, and deeply loved. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. I hope you do. Because it's so important. Jesus' sacrifice broke all the curses. Broke the curses of pain and child. Broke the curses. You know, there's many ways you can toil the land which they discovered. Do you remember? And I saw it. Just finish on this. This is interesting. You know, in the prairies in America, they had a great depression. And much of the food they couldn't grow because what they tried to do is they ploughed the land like they did in other countries. Like in England, they plough very deeply. You know, they plough that deeply that they get a, a farm. Is that right? And so, and so they thought many people were immigrants, so they came from all over, all over Europe. And they came to America, and they get on the big, big prairies to, to plant their crops of, of uh, usually corn, wheat, and, and that sort of thing. And so they tried to use the same things as what they were using in Europe. So they, they plowed the land really deep, but because there was much more, uh, more sunlight and, and wind in that place, what would happen is that the, the furrows would turn to dust and they'd get these huge dust balls and, and the crops would die because they, could, they couldn't work through that dust. They couldn't, couldn't get the, the rainfall to work. So somebody in their wisdom, this went on for many years and, so, and they lost many crops because of it. Somebody went to the Lord and they said, Lord, there must be a, a way, there must be a reason we can stop this. And the Lord showed him, stop doing the big furrows and start just doing the top two inches. And so they plowed just the top two inches. And by doing that, it didn't create a big pile of dust. As the, before the rains, it was only, only small, and then they were able to plant the crops and the plants grow. Just through getting a uh, a word of knowledge from God, something changed drastically. That can happen to you. Whatever situation you you can get a word from the Lord, a word of knowledge, a word of encouragement, a word of wisdom, and your life can change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? Start going to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. He's talking to you all the time, but we just don't always hear. One, because we don't want to. One, because we don't want to spend your time with her. Please stand.